And down the line, we're joined by forensic psychiatrist Dr. Soam Das. Thank you so much. Good Lovely. to see you on the programme again. So let's start with you, Joshua Rosenberg. I mean, it, it was felt that there was a public outcry, a kind of public sense of disbelief that this could be the sentence. But we know that the families, uh, the bereaved families, were deeply, deeply disappointed by the sentence. And so where are we now? Where we are now is that, as you say, this inquiry announced today by the Attorney General, uh, what Victoria Prentice has done is to ask the Inspectorate, His Majesty's Chief Inspector of the Crown Prosecution Service, to look at two things, as you mentioned. One is the decision by the CPS to accept Calacani's guilty pleas to manslaughter, and the second, and I think this is uh, quite important, is whether the Crown Prosecution Service met its duties to consult with families ahead of accepting those pleas. Right, let's start with the first. Yes. Was the CPS right to accept guilty to manslaughter? Mm -hmm. Well, they relied on several psychiatrists, they took medical evidence into account, and they considered that there was no alternative. All the experts agreed this man was mentally ill, he couldn't be tried for murder, he was willing on advice to plead guilty to manslaughter, and he got what is a hospital order, what will likely be a hospital order for the whole of his life. Let me bring Dr. Sam does into this at this point because he, we've, we, we've had you on, this, on the programme before, thank you for uh, rejoining us. You are one of the psychiatrists, forensic psychiatrists, who is frequently called upon in cases such as this. And yours is one of the expert opinions often used to determine whether this really is a case of diminished responsibility on the grounds of some kind of psychiatric illness or disorder or not. So maybe you'll talk us through the kind of process, the sorts of things that you are considering and looking at when you do make your recommendations. Sure, yeah, I'm happy to answer that, Vanessa. So the medico-legal criteria for a finding of diminished responsibility are very clear. You need to have, or the defendant needs to have, an abnormality of mental functioning from a recognized medical condition. So that means there has to be a known diagnosis like Calacane had paranoid schizophrenia. And it has to substantially impair one of three things, either his ability to understand the nature of his conduct. So that means understand what he's doing, which I think he probably did at the time. Form a rational judgment, which I think arguably he couldn't do at the time because of his schizophrenia. And exercise self-control, which again, I think was limited because he was hearing voices, because he had these paranoid delusions. To answer your question about the process, Vanessa, so what happens is usually the defence is instructed first and a psychiatrist, an expert witness such as myself, looks at all of the evidence. So it's not just about assessing the defendant at that moment in time. It's looking through all the medical records, looking through CCTV footage, witness statements, police interview transcripts, just every potential piece of evidence and really extracting whether or not that individual has a known diagnosis and whether they were symptomatic at the time. And I have to say, even though I completely sympathise with the family and I can understand why they're worried that Calacane is getting an easy option. If you purely look at the medical legal criteria, in my view, he clearly meets the criteria for diminished responsibility. And, and let's talk about uh, Joshua Rosenberg, the notion that a family may be very disappointed and very dissatisfied with the sentence and, and the reason for the particular sentence. And the public at large might be deeply disappointed too. They might think this is wrong and it's unfair and it, 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 it somehow exonerates to some extent this killer in a way that they don't find comfortable or they don't find acceptable. What is the situation about changing the law to accommodate public opinion? I don't think there are any plans to change the law in circumstances like this. I think what you need to change is public opinion. Ah. I think you need to explain to people why this was. Now, the judge explained in sentencing remarks, he quoted from the psychiatrist, he quoted the medical evidence, some of it's a bit technical, where I think the CPS is accused of falling down on the job, and this is implicit in what the Attorney General said today, is in explaining all this to the families concerned. They clearly were taken by surprise, they say. They weren't expecting this, they didn't understand it, they didn't see why uh, he couldn't be charged with murder, they didn't understand the attempted murder charges, which are slightly technical, uh, and it looks as if the CPS didn't take the families with them. And what the inspector, Andrew Cayley, is going to have to look at is how the CPS handled this case when they 
uh, knew that they were accepting these pleas of guilty to manslaughter and presumably how they should handle cases like this in the future. And, and, and explain to people the, the job or, the, or the, the sort of duty incumbent upon the CPS. As you say, your, your phrase, to take the families with them. That means what? That means explaining very carefully what could happen, explaining why it might happen so that the families are effectively on side if it does. Yes. Now, on side is exactly right, but the families don't have a say and they have to understand this and that's quite difficult. Mm. It's not up to them to decide what should happen to the person who has killed their loved ones. These criminal proceedings, all criminal proceedings, are be between the state and the defendant. Now, in years gone by, the families, uh, the victims, were just witnesses in court mm. and not given very much uh, respect at all. Now, that's changed in recent years, and rightly so. But ultimately, it's not for the families to decide what should happen to the person who killed their loved ones. All right, let, let's, let's uh, bring back Dr Soam Daz into the picture here. Now, I think what, among the many things that have deeply disappointed and distressed the families is, is the fact that, if we can see Dr Daz on the, on the screen, that would help us, um, is the fact, thank you, is the fact that they, they feel as if uh, Calacani kind of meticulously prepared for these killings. He didn't just imagine that he was flying and jump out of a window or do the sorts of things that we're kind of used to when we think about or we see on films, people in a psychosis, people hearing voices, and they behave in a kind of strangely, in, you know, notably insane kind of way and do spontaneously horribly violent or peculiar self-destructive things. We've all seen that. But I think I think if I've, if I've carefully read what they've said and how they've communicated their deep disappointment, they felt that this was very different. They felt that this was a man in command of sufficient faculties to carefully plan what he was doing. He didn't hear voices and leap out of a window. He, you know, procured the knife. He made the arrangements. He, he, he took the car. He seemed to be sort of strategic. And so there's this feeling of, of capable kind of um, forethought, uh, planning, and the feeling that to be able to do those things, you have to be of sane mind, because if you weren't, you wouldn't be able to get it together to do those things. I mean, we know when people are, you know, in the grips of, let's call it a nervous breakdown, I'm sure you use a different term, but colloquially a nervous breakdown, often it's just too much to get out of bed, wash your face, put your clothes on, it's just too too much. Whereas Calacani was able to accomplish many different steps en route to killing three people who were very, very sorely missed. Yeah, so th there is an explanation for all of this, and that's basically the two things are not mutually exclusive. You can still have purposeful, goal-directed behaviour but at the same time be psychotic and your behavior can be driven by paranoid or psychotic thoughts. So just, just to clarify for your view, viewers, there's two psychiatric defenses. There's not guilty by reason of insanity, which means the individual is completely acquitted. And for that, they literally don't know what they're doing, right? Nobody is suggesting, none of the psychiatrists, the court is suggesting that Calacani meets that criteria. And there's what he got, the, the sentence that he got, which is diminished responsibility. And as the, the name sounds, it's when you have some responsibility, so manslaughter rather than murder, but it's diminished, as in it's lowered. And the criteria are very, very specific. So it's not about whether you can pre-plan, it's not about whether you knew what you were doing, but it was all of those things I mentioned before. The, the uh, substantial impairment of the nature of your conduct, form of rational judgment, exercising self-control. So to conclude what I'm trying to say, you can still be psychotic and driven and be driven by psychotic beliefs. And from what I've read, Calacani absolutely was. He was hearing voices compelling him to act violently. He had these delusional beliefs that if he didn't go out and kill people, that he himself would be harmed or his family would be harmed. So even though what he was doing was purposeful and he knew what he was doing, it was still influenced by these psychotic beliefs and, and symptoms. So another way of saying that, Vanessa, is, in my view, had he not been suffering from that psychosis, had he not been compelled to listen to these voices and uh, the, uh, and to follow these paranoid delusions, then he wouldn't have acted in such an atrocious manner with his killings. Joshua Rosenberg, the Attorney General has has, has uh, uh, demanded a, uh, an examination of this. What What is the potential for any kind of change in the law or indeed any difference to be made in the sentencing? None, I'm afraid. Um, oh. The interesting thing is that in the statement from the Attorney General's office today, 
she says uh, that she's looking at the sentence under the unduly lenient sentencing scheme. She's considering whether to refer this uh, case to the Court of Appeal on the basis that the hospital order was unduly lenient. I don't think she will. And if she does, I don't think the Court of Appeal will change it. I don't think the law will change because it is right that people who uh, are mentally ill uh, have these delusions and, and whatever it is that uh, uh, Dr. Sam Das has been explaining very correctly and carefully to you, mm -hmm. it's right that they should be given treatment. Yes, they must be in a secure hospital and that's what's going to happen to this man. It's what's ha happening to him now. Uh, but we don't put people like that in prison, not least because of the danger that they're going to kill other prisoners and prison officers. So I can't see the law changing diminished responsibility. We could change the way in which the courts organise it so you don't have this business of being charged with murder and then having to plead to manslaughter and, and so on. Uh, but in terms of how you deal with people who are mentally ill in this way, I can't see any change. Uh, what I can see coming from this inquiry is the CPS being much more careful next time to explain to the people most affected by a crime what this actually means. And Dr Das, I mean, what, what, what has been felt by many people is that this sentence is the soft option. Now, on this programme, you've already explained why you don't think that's the case. Other legal experts have also agreed. We had a former judge saying this is not a soft option. This is not kind of a sojourn in an open prison where you get to go out to the cinema and, and, and you know, and grow vegetables in a charming greenhouse. It's really not that at all. So maybe you'll explain and describe what Calacani's life in this secure hospital is going to be like. Sure. So he's been sectioned under the Mental Health, Health Act to a high secure hospital. So even though it's technically not a prison, there are some similarities. You know, it's it's a it's a locked environment where patients are restricted in their in their their ability to to travel between wards and to leave. But the focus very much is on rehabilitation rather than punishment. So to give you some specific examples, patients aren't kept in a in a room or a cell. They're encouraged to be out on the ward. There is the, there will be a heavy emphasis on trying to cure his schizophrenia through medication. There'll be some rehabilitation in terms of psychological uh, therapy to to try and and really drill down to the reasons why he offended. So I know from what I've read that one of the major risk factors for Calacane was a lack of insight and not taking his medication when, he's, when he was in the community. So that would be one of the key factors to, to try and educate him about the reason why he needs to take his medication. There's also other rehabilitation activities, everything from sports to the gym, to education, to occupational therapy. So it's very much geared to make somebody eventually safe in view of releasing them. I know there's been a lot of talk about whether he'll spend the rest of his life or not within this high secure hospital. And I, I know the judge suggested that he might, but with all due respect to that judge, it's not actually up to the judge. It's up to the forensic psychiatrist that's in charge of his care with permission from the Ministry of Justice. And Joshua Rosenberg, you know, we hear the phrase, the law is an ass. In this instance, do you think this law is asinine and needs some kind of change or are you content with this particular element of the law? I'm content. I, I think that we have to listen to the psychiatrist. It's worth saying that the judge made an additional order, in addition to the, the normal order, which effectively meant that if uh, this man, Kalikani, does recover, then special consideration is given to whether he should be released. Uh, but yes, if people are ill, they need to be treated. Uh, they need to be kept in secure surroundings so that they're not uh, they're not uh, a risk to anybody else or to themselves. Um, and uh, we have to accept that, you know, this happens. Why it happened, how it was allowed to happen, lots of questions need to be asked. But how the law deals with it, uh, on this occasion, I can't really see any obvious way of making it better. Thank you very much. Thank you both very much indeed.